This is a call to come find yourself again. In New Brunswick, Casey Irving is blamed for just about anything wrong with the province. Perhaps because he owns so much of it, something like $400 million worth. This is a people and a place waiting to welcome you. We're Irving people and we're Irving Oil says the explosion and subsequent fire occurred when a diesel treating unit malfunctioned. The thing is, if you have 10% of the market down here in the oil business, you know what happens to you? You go broke. In the Maritimes, Irving is the dominant, enthusiastic team no one can beat. The unions know that, so does the government. New Brunswick in eastern Canada is known for its picturesque views and rural charm. It also houses the largest oil refinery in the country and one of the most prolific logging operations. And yet, New Brunswick is the second poorest province in the country. Why? The answer, in part, lies in six letters, written in blue on stark white containers outside of the refinery in St. John, New Brunswick. I-R-V-I-N-G. Irving. Irving means people. Whether it be logging, oil, going to the gas station, shipbuilding, construction, transportation, media, hardware stores, or minor hockey, you more or less can't sneeze in New Brunswick without it landing on something the Irvings own. There's a good chance you've never heard of the Irving family. In fact, they like it that way. The family owns so much and has so much control over the province of New Brunswick that the entire province has been called a company town. Their massive empire, now worth billions of dollars, had humble beginnings, as most empires do. Casey Irving, the patriarch of the family, grew up in the small town of Buktouche, New Brunswick, where his family owned a local sawmill. In the late 1920s, Casey opened a gas station under the name of Irving Oil. By 1930, he was selling gas in 11 cities across three provinces, and that was only the beginning. Business continued to grow. After making his way through several ventures, Casey set up a refinery in St. John, the city that would become the center of Irving's operations until today. By the 50s, Casey was the most powerful person in New Brunswick, and it wasn't particularly close. The Irving's first challenging moment on the public stage was a contentious oil worker strike in 1963. It was perhaps the first public exhibition of the Irving's ruthlessness, commitment to profit, and control over government and lawmakers. Irving was able to get judges to put restrictions on picketing and ban picketing entirely at secondary Irving businesses. Oil workers burned effigies of Casey Irving in protest and incited boycotts of Irving businesses. Casey finally raised wages after seven months, ending the strike. Casey was smart. He was one of the first Canadians to utilize offshore trusts to significantly lower his tax bill. He placed his companies in trusts in Bermuda, where he would live most of his later life after his sons Arthur, James, and John were grown and taking care of the business. The move reduced his and the company's tax bill by millions of dollars every year. To this day, Irving Oil pays around $10 million less in taxes per year than many of their competitors. And that brings us to perhaps the Irving's biggest and most consequential skill, avoiding taxes. In 2004, Irving Oil was in talks with the Spanish energy company Repsol to build a $1.2 billion liquefied natural gas terminal in New Brunswick. Irving agreed to lease Repsol the land they needed in exchange for a 25% stake in the deal. The then CEO of Irving Oil, Arthur's son Kenneth, approached the government of St. John. He told them the margins on the deal were extremely slim. For Irving to make money on the deal, they couldn't possibly pay the property tax that the government required. Kenneth asked that instead of paying $8 million a year for the next 25 years in property tax, they would pay 500000 The mayor at the time looked Kenneth in the eye and believed him. He brought the deal to the council and gave them until midnight to decide. St. John was in rough shape at the time. The new terminal would provide jobs and boost the economy. They agreed. Three. Three. 
But 10 years later, the truth of the situation came to light. Irving Oil had signed a contract finalizing the venture weeks before the tax concession was passed. The contract guaranteed that Irving Oil would get at least $20 million a year in profits from Repsol, meaning that the deal would have been extremely profitable even at the normal property tax rate. That wasn't the first or the last time that the Irving family bullied government into favorable tax deals or used taxpayer money for their own purposes. In 2013, it was revealed that taxpayers in Moncton paid $88,000 per year to the Moncton Wildcats hockey team to compensate for lost revenue in corporate seats. Can you guess who owns the Moncton Wildcats? In June of 2023, Irving was faced with a series of required changes needed to satisfy the federal clean fuel regulations. These changes, of course, would have cost Irving money. So what did they do? They went to their old friend, Blaine Higgs, the premier of New Brunswick, who also happens to have worked for Irving Oil for 33 years. Higgs and Irving came up with a fantastic idea. Rather than having Irving pay to make the required changes, they would pass the cost on to the consumer. Gas went up by eight cents in the province to some of the highest prices in the country. That eight cents a liter goes right back to Irving Oil to use to clean up their operations something that they are required by federal law to do anyway. New Brunswickers experience some of the highest rates of energy poverty in the country, with nearly 63% of citizens struggling to afford to heat and cool their homes and power their lights and appliances. Not poor enough, it seems, to pay for Irving Oil to follow the law. The kicker is that the clean fuel regulations only apply to oil used in Canada, which amounts to just 20% of Irving Oil's operations. Irving is able to exert this type of control because they own the entire supply chain, from the refinery, to the tankers, to the distribution terminals, to the gas stations, to the shipbuilding companies, and the ships that transport their oil. For provincial and municipal governments, their relationship with Irving has become nearly parasitic. These governments continue to miss out on millions of dollars of tax revenue they could use to reinvest in their communities because of deals they've struck with Irving. This leaves St. John and New Brunswick as a whole in debt and with few opportunities. Irving provides those opportunities. Employers the province and city can't afford to lose because they're in debt and have very few other opportunities. The Irving Empire is unlike most other conglomerates of their size in that none of their companies are publicly traded. This allows them to keep an air of secrecy and make decisions completely within the family. Uh, a personal question, Mr. Irving, why do you keep so much in the, in the background? Uh, you rarely make uh, public appearances or, or statements. What's the reason for this? <laughs> well, um, perhaps that's a question of opinion. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, Maybe after I see this on TV, I'll be more in what you call in the background than ever. <laughs> and it turns out it becomes even easier to control what information is out there about your company when you control all of the information. By the 40s, Casey Irving owned a newspaper. Well, it wasn't long before he owned the newspapers. All of them every English daily newspaper and all but one French daily newspaper, and most of the weekly and community papers. The one newspaper they didn't own? It used Irving for their printing services. Into the 80s, they owned several radio stations and TV stations in New Brunswick. Nothing was said in the province without the Irving stamp of approval. This, first and foremost, is why you may never have heard of them. In New Brunswick, it has been nearly impossible to publicly criticize them in any kind of meaningful way because they own every avenue available to criticize them. Today, things are a bit different when it comes to their media empire. The Irving sold Brunswick News, the largest publisher in the province and the owner of the province's three largest newspapers, to Post Media Network. Jamie Irving was appointed executive chair of the board at Post Media shortly after, but stepped down from the position in June of 2023. Whether it be the rise of social media, which is information the Irvings can't control, or the fact that print media is no longer as profitable as it used to be, the Irvings' grip on information in New Brunswick seems to be loosening. 
However, it's not simply in the media where the Irvings exert their control over information. In 2015, Dr. Eilish Cleary was the chief medical officer of health in New Brunswick. She was studying the effects of glyphosate, a herbicide used heavily within the forestry industry, which has in recent years been linked to cancer. But for the Irvings to continue their prolific logging operations at a sufficiently profitable pace, they need to use glyphosate. Dr. Cleary was fired shortly before her report was published. The government denies that her firing had anything to do with her report on glyphosate, yet no official reason for her dismissal has ever been put forth. And her severance package was $720,000. And she's not the only official in New Brunswick to be dismissed while studying the effects of glyphosate. In recent years, Irving's logging operations have become increasingly profitable and a starting point for several of their other businesses. Much of the land that they log is crown land that is leased to them. And since 2001, they started pushing the province for access to more land. The Conservative Premier at the time delayed making a decision, but when Liberal Sean Graham was elected, he came forward with 900 letters from concerned citizens saying it was in the best interest of the province to open up more land for Irving to log. A closer investigation showed that many of the letters came from Irving logging employees or were auto-populated by a website created by Irving. The grand total of letters that came from any other source? Nine. I could go on and on about strange policies passed in favor of the Irvings by politicians of all backgrounds and affiliations. The point is, in New Brunswick, they get what they want, when they want, no matter who is in office. Since they own so much of the province and are its top employer, the very threat to move any Irving operation out of the province is usually enough to get the government to cave. If you look today at the portions of the Irving empire that they want you to see, you'll see many promising developments. Irving oil is moving away from fossil fuels into renewable energy. They're helping to build a massive wind farm. They are the largest owner of land in Maine and they use that land to plant billions of trees. There's some truth to all of those claims. But Irving's history when it comes to the environment is and continues to be grim. Irving owned facilities in St. John have shown to emit a mixture of carcinogens, including benzene and lead. In fact, studies have shown that lung cancer rates in St. John are 40 to 50% higher than in Fredericton and Moncton. New Brunswick's other major cities. Do with that information what you will. Irving's pulp and paper mill has been fined numerous times for significant discharges into the St. John River. They've been criticized for using destructive and unsustainable practices to grow trees as quickly and cheaply as possible and still using glyphosate. In 2013, the Canadian government changed the laws around offshore tax havens, and the Irving Empire had to be divided between Casey's sons to avoid huge taxes. The third generation of Irvings are now taking over the businesses, but cracks are beginning to form in the once impenetrable family unit. Arthur Irving has stepped down as chairman of Irving Oil, and his daughter Sarah is no longer a member of the leadership team either. Kenneth Irving, the once heir apparent for Irving Oil stepped away from the company years ago when the stress of the position led him to self-harm. His father no longer speaks to him. Rumors abound that Irving Oil is for sale. If it does sell, the impact on New Brunswick would be substantial, to say the least. The Irvings have always been exceptional at adapting to changing technologies and being early adopters of profitable trends. Perhaps all the noise around Irving Oil is just smoke and mirrors as they transition to something new. Or maybe splitting the business in 2013 destroyed something fundamental to the Irving's success. An insulated system of family that produced everything and answered to no one. Time will tell if the sun is setting on the house of Irving. But at least for now, New Brunswick is a company town. <laughs>